member statement. And I recognize the member from Cambridge. Well, it was a pleasure speaking about my two pets today. I'm sure Ginger and Scout are watching us right now on TV, if Lassie isn't on. But, Madam Speaker, with much pride, I share with you some very good news from, my, from a school in my writing today. The International School of Cambridge was recently ranked by the Fraser Institute as one of the top schools in Ontario. The school, which is owned and operated by the Islamic Centre of Cambridge, was one of the 13 schools in the province to receive a perfect score of 10. As such, the school was ranked number one among 2,975 schools across Ontario. The International School of Cambridge, formerly known as the Islamic School of Cambridge, was founded in 1992 and is attended by approximately 300 students enrolled in grades uh, 8 all the way down to junior kindergarten. The school attracts students not only from Cambridge, but also from Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph and Bramford. Mohammed Dar, chairman of the Islamic Centre of Cambridge, had this to say about the school's success. We are really excited. It's a matter of great pride for us. We maintain high standards of teaching and with quali quality uh, facilities as a reason for the school. This makes us stand out among others. The Fraser Institute's report card on Ontario elementary schools ranks public, Catholic, independent schools based on nine <coughs> academic indicators derived from the province-wide test results. Congratulations to the students, teachers, Thank you to the member. Thank you. I recognize the member from Waterloo. Windsor West, Madam Speaker. Mom in this corner. <laughs> the backlog at Ontario's land and landlord and tenant board has expanded to over 53,000 cases. In Windsor West and across the province, we're amidst the most severe housing and homelessness crisis in recent history. Every day, the Premier gives his commitment to providing shelter for the people of Ontario, yet year after year, tenants and landlords alike are left waiting for justice. Under this Conservative government, the wait list has quadrupled. Since 2018, when this Premier formed government, the Tribunal has handled fewer applications every single year. This backlog is a testament to a system spiralling out of control, as highlighted in the report by Tribunal Watch Ontario. Tenants facing maintenance disputes and extremely long waits of over 14 months for resolution, while landlords struggling with rent non-payment eviction cases are left hanging for more than a year. This is unacceptable. The report highlights that the root of this issue lies in the politicization of the LTB by this Conservative government, favouring political appointments over experienced professionals who have knowledge in the field to make decisions fairly and quickly. Every day my office hears from tenants and landlords about the serious consequences of this, with individuals having to bear significant personal costs, lost housing, poor living conditions for tenants, and significant financial hardships, particularly impacting small landlords. My Ontario NDP colleagues and I continue to call on this government to implement much-needed reforms of the LTB, as suggested by the Ombudsman. It's time to ensure that all Ontarians receive the justice and relief they so desperately need. Thank you. Member statement. The member from Starmont, Langary Dundon. Thank you, Speaker. Today, I'd like to highlight the importance of our local dairy farmers and dairy producers. On Monday, I attended the Stormont Dairy Producers Annual General Meeting in my riding. I'm really good at selling ice cream cones, but I'm no expert in dairy farming or agriculture. <laughs> what I do know is that our local dairy farmers work long hours, day and night, to ensure our communities have high-quality dairy products. At the AGM, I learned that Ontario is second largest dairy producer in Canada, accounting for over 32% of total dairy farm cash receipts in Canada. I also learned that dairy farming is the largest sector of Ontario agriculture, and as per the DFO 2023 annual report, Ontario is home to 3,213 dairy producers. That's pretty impressive. Next month, I'll be attending the Dairy Cares event in my riding. Dairy Cares is an important event for our community where local, dairy farmers, stakeholders, and agribusinesses from across SDNG come together to celebrate and thank our three local hospitals. 
the Cornwall Community Hospital, the Winchester District Memorial Hospital, and Glengarry District Memorial Hospital. All funds raised at the Dairy Cares event go to these three hospitals. Last year, the event raised $187,488. I'm excited to know how much they can raise this year. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. You, met, you meet many people in your life, and for whatever reason, some of them just stick with you. One person in my life is the Honourable Concilio Dinino. Sometimes it feels like the forces of the world wanted us to get to know each other. He was in the Senate when I was in kindergarten on the opposite side of the world. As a young activist full of passion and energy, I was restless to change the world, and he was the wise sage with wisdom and encouragement along the way. He was the first person who told me I should run for office. Years later, I would seek public office, except as an NDP candidate. Even so, he endorsed me, donated to my campaign, and has always championed me. I would go on to become the MPP for Parkdale High Park, representing the very neighborhood he grew up in as a young Italian immigrant boy. He was a Parkdale kid, worked at the TD Bank at the corner of Jameson and Queen, went to school up the street on Roncesvalles at St. Vincent de Paul. Inspired by his mentors, he lived with, with the motto, life is about what you give, not what you get. And he's given so much. He was volunteer chair of the Harbour Front Corporation, president of the Canadian Italian Business Association, president of Scouts Canada Toronto, a founder of Villa Charities, and so on. Most important to me, he has been the strongest voice for the Tibetan people in Canada. As someone who enjoyed high-altitude hiking, he went to Tibet and visited Jokhang Temple in Lhasa, the capital. While there, a monk took a big risk and secretly handed him a piece of paper with a message. The message was to tell the world of what was going on in Tibet. And Speaker, Concilio Dinino has carried that message since that day for over 30 years. Khan, or Uncle Khan, as many call him, you've changed and shaped lives, including mine. Thank you for everything. Oh, okay. Further member statements, I just want to remind the members that as you come in, just to keep it down as the member statements are being said, I recognize the member from Glengarry Prescott. Madam Speaker, we celebrate uh, the National Day of uh, Francophonie. Uh, this is a very important day uh, for Franco Ontarians and Franco Ontarians <coughs> and Francophones across Canada. <coughs> The International Day of Francophonie was created in 1988 to celebrate on March 20th with the objective uh, to share an appreciation of the French language and the French uh, culture. Uh, today, uh, 100 million Francophones live on the continent. So Ontario uh, includes uh, 620,000 a francophone community. This is the largest community, francophone, francophone community outside of Quebec. So, uh, 1.5 uh, million Ontarians that speak French. Uh, the Day of Francophonie is an important to gather together as a community and to honor French language. And in 2020, uh, Madam Chair, my colleague, a member of uh, Mr. Sigasov uh, had a chance to, uh, to propose amendments uh, to the Francophone uh, legislation uh, to designate the Franco Ontarian uh, flag as an uh, official emblem of Ontario. It was uh, sanctioned on the, uh, to September 24, 2020, and the flag Franco Ontarian is the eighth official symbol of Ontario. Our government acknowledges the contribution of the French language to the vitality and the success of Ontario. We have demonstrated this commitment for Francophones. We have demonstrated that by monitoring the, the French Language Services Act for the first time in more than 35 years, Madam Chair. Alors, as a member, Mr. Chair, alors, as a uh, writing with the largest presence of Francophones in Ontario, it is with a great uh, excitement that we celebrate this day today with you. And that whether you're part of the Francophone community, whether or you, you would like uh, to uh, your, uh, learn the language, uh, this day is for you. Merci. Member statements. The member for Spadina Fort Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On, on Sunday morning, a devastating fire ripped through the Ward Island uh, clubhouse on the Toronto Islands. 
The clubhouse was built by the Islanders in 1937-38 and for generations has been a gathering place for the island community. A white clapboard structure it housed the Island Cafe, which was a favourite stop for a delicious meal and good company on the lawn near the ferry dock. The thing I'll remember about the clubhouse was the screen door, because there's something about the slamming of a screen door that just speaks of summer, and it's not something that you expect to hear in downtown Toronto. Many irreplaceable archives were lost, including a handwritten list of Islanders who served in World War II and photos of the community dating back to the 1930s. The island community is a village and one of the tightest-knit communities in Toronto. Last night, the community gathered to mourn the loss of the beloved clubhouse. They sang, tied ribbons on the protective fencing, held lanterns from the Shadowland Theatre, and encircled the ashes of the building to say goodbye. While people are gathering the memories of the old clubhouse, they are beginning to think and talk about rebuilding, about creating a new gathering place for generations <coughs> of islanders and visitors to meet, dance, organize, mourn, and celebrate. As one islander said, the spirit of this building will live on in a new form. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, on February 29th, the Madawaska Valley bid farewell to one of its leading citizens, Gerard O'Malley, just 10 days after his 65th birthday. Affectionately known as Tootie, he passed away while battling cancer. Well known and deeply respected, he was a successful businessman along with his partners, Neil and Connie O'Reilly. As co owner operator of the local Metro grocery store, Tootie was famous for his positive attitude, his unparalleled approach to customer service, and his compassion and generosity to those in need. From his teenage years, he was laser focused on his goals and willing to sacrifice and work hard to attain them. What really set him apart was that 40 years ago, he suffered a critical injury playing hockey and lived the rest of his life as a paraplegic. It was at this time that he faced his proverbial fork in the road. While it certainly was not easy, his determination and faith led him to choose a path of positivity and accepting each and every day as an opportunity. The life he lived after his accident has been an inspiration to so many, including myself. Rather than feeling sorry for himself, he did whatever he could do to enhance the lives of others. His examples of bearing his cross with a smile encouraged everyone he met to be better. From his Metro family and all of their customers to the community at large, we were all gifted to witness his strength and grace facing his enormous challenges head on each and every day. I was blessed to know Tootie most of his life. He leaves a mark on our community that will not be forgotten. May he rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the drug poisoning crisis in my riding and in communities across Ontario is at a breaking point. Last year, Ontario saw an estimated 3,644 drug-related deaths and over 20,000 have died since 2018. That's 20,000 children, grandchildren, siblings, friends, and neighbours. On March 4th, an urgent letter was sent to the Ministry of Health, signed by over 50 advocacy organizations, requesting direct emergency funding by March 29th to supervise consumption sites. These are clinics that provide scientifically informed, evidence-based approaches to navigating a documented health condition. Staff here provide more than health care. They provide hope, connections, and pathways to employment, housing, and other services. As of yesterday, they received no response. Safe consumption sites are essential to put an end to this crisis, and they must include inhalation services and be scaled up immediately to prevent further tragedies. The crisis isn't going away. I want to thank the passionate and underpaid nurses and staff of the CTS and Kitchener Centre who are proud of the deaths that they prevent every day at their clinic. I also want to thank the staff of the Working Centre Sanguine Health, A Better Tent City, Michael Parkinson, and many others providing direct service and advocacy to support equitable access and care to all. Thank you very much. 
Member statements. The member for Nepean. Thank you very much, Speaker. As community leaders, we hope and we pray that a crisis never hits our community, that we never have to be with a family that is in desperate need. However, that is something that did happen in my community of Barhaven in the city of Ottawa on March the 6th, when a man, a father, a woman, a mother, and her four children were murdered by a knife-wielding maniac. My colleagues uh, in Ottawa, we stood to the, together with the remaining family member, the father of the uh, four children and the husband of the woman, to mark the sadness and tragedy there that befell him and our community. I ask all members to think, if you're a parent, about the children that you've reared and, and raised. Because it's one thing to see something on the news and to say what a terrible tragedy it is when four children die, but it's quite another to remember that those children could have been our children. For example, a two-and-a-half-year-old child, Kelly, was murdered. I think any of us who have had a child remember a two-and-a-half-year-old when they first learn to smile and they know who their mom and dad are, and they bring us so much joy, they're worth every sleepless night. There was a two-and-a-half-year-old child, Rinyana. I sat in front of her little tiny white casket. Rinyana had this beautiful little smile. She looked like any two-and-a-half, three-year-old would. The terrible twos. When they do something that you don't want them to do, but they're so cute you laugh about it anyway. Then there was the four-year-old sister. She was just beautiful. She had such a smile. Her name was Ashwini, and she had just started school. She was in that age where we remember our children becoming little people. They weren't quite babies. They're not quite big kids that go to elementary school, but they're just starting out. And you're starting to understand if they like the maths, the sciences, if they're into English and reading books, or if they like to draw and they're more creative. And then a grade two student, seven years old, a young boy, Anuka, who loved to play soccer with his friends and have lots of fun. That's who died in my constituency on March the 6th, senseless, tra tragic deaths. And the family, though they were Sri Lankan and, of course, they were also Buddhist, I reminded them that they were also Barhavenites. From the 911 call from a neighbour to the local police who attended on the scene to the paramedics who looked after the victims as well as the father who had to go to the hospital, the hospital staff and, of course, the nurses and doctors there straight through to the teachers at Monsignor Paul Baxter School, who had to explain to all of the students there the next day why two of their seats, two of their desks, were empty. No words can express their tragic circumstances. All I can say, I know, Speaker, on behalf of every good person in this chamber, of which every one of us are, that we wish that their memories be a blessing and that may justice be served. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> member statements. The member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On Friday, March 8th, we celebrate the invaluable social, economic, cultural, and political contributions of women have made in our society. Women continue to shape the world and play an important role in advancing our society, whether that be through the role of mothers, wives, siblings, friends, or co-workers. Mr. Speaker, International Women's Day also gives us an opportunity to acknowledge the progress made in advancing gender equality and working towards a world free of bias, stereotypes, and discrimination regarding of, regardless of it on the basis of sex or race. We must continue to strive to create an environment where every woman has the opportunity to reach their full potential and be able to thrive and contribute fully to society. Speaker, this past weekend I had the opportunity to join Paddy Entertainment and Sonali Sandhu for their Women's Day celebration. It is crucial we continue to continue having conversations that amplify the voices of women, champion their rights, and advocate for policies that promote inclusivity and justice. 
Together, let us continue to break barriers, defy expectations, and build a future where every woman has the opportunity to reach their full potential. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning.